We talked about a lot of gas laws. Remember that scientific laws are based on observation. They say what happens. They don't explain why. Now we're going to talk about the why, kinetic molecular theory. This is the simplest model for gas behavior that actually works pretty well. In this theory, we uh, describe gases as a collection of particles. Those could be molecules or atoms. And those particles are in constant motion. So here we have an illustration of a flask containing gases. And we see these little spheres. And they're zinging around. They're going to collide with the walls of the container. They're also going to occasionally run into each other. But they're in constant motion. So the ideas in kinetic molecular theory, the first one is the size of a particle is negligibly small. So this actual size of the gas particles doesn't really matter because they are so small compared to the entire volume that they occupy. We traveled on a family vacation through uh, the state of Wyoming. And we looked up the population in the AAA guidebook. The first time we did this, when I made this observation, was before the time of smartphones. And so we actually had a paper book we were looking in. The population of Wyoming is roughly the same as the population of Fresno without Clovis. Just Fresno. The whole state. OK? That's like a gas. because. The number of people occupying that whole state is so small. The size of the people doesn't really matter. You get people in an elevator, and the size of the people, whether they're you know, four-year-olds or linebackers on the Fresno City College football team, matters a lot, right? You're going to get a lot more four-year-olds in an elevator than you're going to get linebackers because of the size of the people. If they're spread out over the entire area of the state of Wyoming, the size of the people doesn't matter. And that's how gases are. The volume that the gas occupies is so much larger than the particles that they don't matter. So standard temperature and pressure, argon atoms occupy 0.01% of the gas volume. The rest of it is empty space. So it's hard to imagine. Let's put it into terms that we can think about. If an argon atom was the size of a golf ball, its nearest neighbor would be four feet away. So you know how big a golf ball is, right? Like this, this big golf ball here, and then its nearest neighbor would be over here. That's how much space there is between gas particles. So if the particle is a little bigger, a little smaller, it doesn't matter at all. The average kinetic energy of the gas particles is directly proportional to the temperature in kelvins. You raise the temperature, you raise the average speed of the particles. Not all the particles are moving at the same speed. There are fast ones and slow ones, but the average is proportional to the temperature. When you have collisions of particles with each other or with the walls of the container, it's a complete, completely elastic collision. So that is a physics concept. Um, an elastic collision is one where no energy is lost. It's hard to reproduce in real life because there's always losses. But on this very, very small scale, it's an el a perfectly elastic collision. So one of the closest things we have to that would be like uh, billiard balls running into each other, or perhaps an air hockey table where the puck runs into the wall. And it keeps going. It changes direction, but it keeps going at about the same speed. An inelastic collision would be rolling two lumps of clay together. And they just go boom, and they stop. That's inelastic. So there's no energy loss in any of these collisions. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. So billiard balls running into each other, 
they bounce off and they keep going. And the speed and energy is, is largely the same. In an inelastic collision, all that kinetic energy that those clay lumps or clay balls bring to this collision gets dissipated as heat and it's lost. So those are the four ideas of kinetic molecular theory, which in some of these slides I've abbreviated as KMT because it just takes up a lot of space. So now we're going to look at how does kinetic molecular theory explain these things that we've observed. Um, it explains gas pressure. The gas particles are constantly moving and they're striking the walls of the container. They strike the walls with a force and the result of lots of particles and many collisions gives rise to the, the pressure. The pressure is the force of those collisions divided by the area over which they collide. KMT explains Boyle's law. Remember, Boyle's law is that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure. So if we look at this gas container here, we see it's got a certain number of gas particles in it. And when we squeeze down, when we compress it and make it smaller, what's going to happen to the pressure? The pressure is going to go up because now these particles are in a smaller container they're going to run into the walls more frequently. Okay? Does that make sense? What I love about gases and this kinetic molecular theory is it relates so closely to Newtonian physics concepts that we observe in everyday life. And, and so we can imagine and think through these things without having to actually just flat out memorize them. Charles' law was that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the absolute temperature. And that was when we keep the amount of gas constant and we keep the pressure constant. Well, kinetic molecular theory says if you increase the temperature, the average speed of the particles increases. The average kinetic energy goes up and so the velocity goes up. Um, this will come up later, but let me just remind you of it right now. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half mass times the velocity squared. When you change the temperature of a gas, you're not changing the mass of the particles. Kinetic energy is going up. That means that the velocity has to change. So the velocity goes up. The particles are moving faster. It makes sense they're running into the walls more frequently. Not only are they running into the walls more frequently, but they're hitting with greater force. If the pressure is to remain constant, then we have to increase the size of the container to get that force over area back down to the same level. So to maintain a constant pressure, the gas will occupy a greater volume to spread out the collisions. Avogadro's law. Volume of a gas is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules. Well, you put more gas molecules into a container, what's going to happen? They're going to run into the walls more frequently because just there's more of them, right? In order to keep the pressure constant, then, you have to increase the volume of the gas to get the number of collisions down. Dalton's law. Total pressure of a gas mixture is the sum of the partial pressures of each of the gases in the mixture. Well, kinetic molecular theory says that the particles have negligible size and they don't interact with each other. Particles of different masses are going to have the same energy, kinetic energy, at a given temperature. If that average kinetic energy is the same, we're going to have a, the same pressure. And so the pressure from each of the gases is just based on the number of particles, not on the size of the particles. So the pressure of each gas in the mixture adds together to give the total pressure. So I had an analogy 
I think it had to do with kindergartners. I think it had to do with people running around in, let's put them in a racquetball court. Okay, a bunch of people in a racquetball court, they're running around. Okay, so the pressure is equivalent to the number of times people run into the walls. We're going to disregard them running into each other. So if you have one person in there running around, just running, they're blindfolded. Let's add that. They're blindfolded. So they're going to run in a straight line until they run into the wall, then they'll bounce off and, and run somewhere else. Now, why would they do this? I don't know. It, it doesn't have to make sense, but you can imagine. So they're running into the walls. You put more people in there, they're going to run into the walls more often, right? Does it matter if they're boys or girls, if they're running at the same speed? No, it doesn't. The identity of the particles doesn't matter. Does it matter if they're four-year-olds or linebackers? If they're running at the same speed, if they have the same kinetic energy, really, they have the same kinetic energy, the, the size of the person isn't going to matter. The identity of the gas particle doesn't matter. That's something that's a little hard to get your brain around because it matters with everything else, but with gases it doesn't. Does anybody have any questions? I've either explained it so beautifully or I've like totally confused you. Um, okay. So temperature and molecular velocities. Uh, the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule is going to depend on its mass and its average velocity. Kinetic energy equals one-half mass times the velocity squared. I don't think we're going to need that equation, but we just need to understand the relationship. So if the particles have different masses, the only way for them to have the same kinetic energy would be to have different average velocities. I feel like I'm missing a slide here. Yeah, I am. Okay, so let me just back up a second here. Um, there's a slide that accidentally got hidden. Um, let's just pause. Okay, here's the slide we were missing. Um, how does kinetic molecular theory work with the ideal gas law? Um, you can actually derive the ideal gas law from the ideas in kinetic molecular theory. And your book goes through the whole derivation. It's all very nice, but you won't be tested on it. And we're behind, so I've decided not to go over it in lecture. Um, but it predicts behavior consistent with our observations and with measurements that we make of gases. The scientific theory is the most powerful kind of scientific knowledge because it explains. It explains and it predicts. Now, it turns out that the ideal gas law and this model break down under certain conditions. It's not perfect, but it still helps us to understand uh, more about gases. And when we look at where the model breaks down, then that causes us to investigate more and understand more. Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, I lost that. Kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. So if we have different particle masses, but everything has the same average kinetic energy, then the average velocities of these different particles must be different. So in my dumb analogy of people running around in a racquetball court, the, the large linebacker being very massive is going to be running slower than the little kindergartner. But when they strike the wall, it's going to be with the same amount of force. Well, determining an average velocity is not as simple as it may, may seem. Um, we're going to use what's called the root mean square velocity. It's just a special type of average. And we don't need to go into the details of it, but it's the root mean square velocity. It's very close to the average velocity. And so we can say that the average kinetic energy is 1 over Avogadro's number times the mass times the uh, root mean square 
velocity squared. Things get a little weird here. So what we observe is that in a gas mixture, given temperature, the lighter particles travel faster on average than the heavier ones do. And this is the relationship. So the root mean square velocity, the average velocity is equal to the square root of 3 times the ideal gas constant times the temperature in Kelvin divided by the molar mass in kilograms per moles. And that's so the units work out. Here R is not the familiar 0 0.08206 because we need different units here. So 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. There are relationships between joules and newtons and kilograms and, and it, it gets a little complicated. So probably just take it at face value here. So this is the equation. So when we're using this equation, the molar mass has to be in kilograms per mole. And we're going to use 8.314 for the gas constant. We calculate the root mean square velocity of gaseous neon, neon, xenon, atoms at 25. Well, let's write down that equation before we forget. So the average velocity is equal to the square root of 3RT over the molar mass in kilograms per mole. So here we've got 3 and the um, gas constant we're going to use is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. What's 25 degrees Celsius in Kelvins? It's 298, 298.15 Kelvins, divided by xenon. Xenon is 131.3 grams, right? Let's not do too much stuff in our head. 131.3 grams per mole. So if we're going to convert to kilograms, then we're dividing by 1,000. So in kilograms per mole, it's 0 0.1313 kilograms per mole. So that's going to go in the denominator, 0 0.1313 kilograms per mole. And the square root of the whole mess. So 3 times 8.314 times 298.15 divided by 0.1313 equals, and then the square root of that, um, it's going to be 230, how many sig figs do we have? We've got 3, 238. Now here's the question, what are the units? Well, the Kelvin's canceled, and the moles canceled. What we've got left here is joules per kilogram. The square root of. That doesn't look like a speed, does it? Well, a joule is a meter squared kilogram, oh, sorry, a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So if we take kilogram meter squared per second squared and divide it by kilograms and take the square root of that, the kilograms cancel out and the square root takes care of the squares and we get meters per second. So the average velocity, the root mean square velocity for gaseous xenon atoms is 238 meters per second. Is that a fast rate of speed? 
Yeah. 238 meters is roughly 250 yards, right? Two and a half football fields in a second. Gas particles are moving very, very fast. They're tiny, but they are moving. Any questions about that one? The units there get a little wonky to deal with. I, I will not try to trick you on that. What, what you need to be careful of is to use the correct value of the gas constant and to get your molar mass in kilograms per mole. I'll give you this equation for the exam. And I'll give you this value of the gas constant and the other value of the gas constant. You need to know which one to use, OK? Here's a graph of um, the relative number of molecules with a specific velocity versus molecular velocity in meters per second for different gases. So here we have oxygen, nitrogen, water. Um, and oxygen's molar mass is going to be 32, and 28, and 18, and 4, and 2. And so what we see is that the lighter particles are going to have broader distributions. They, they also, if you look at the, the average is going to be roughly in the middle of these curves, they also have um, a larger average velocity. They're moving faster, but they also have a lot more variability in the, in the uh, velocity. We can look at the effect of temperature on molecular velocity. Um, here we've got, again, relative number of particles. This, time's nitri this time it's nitrogen. Relative number of particles with the indicated velocity versus the molecular velocity. And we see that as the temperature increases, the average molecular velocity goes up, which is what kinetic molecular theory predicts. We also see, though, that this curve flattens and broadens. And so we get more variability as the temperature goes up. So you still have some that are moving very, very slowly. You also have some that are moving very, very rapidly. Mean free path is a concept we need to talk, talk about. Um, so gas particles are going to travel in straight lines until they run into something because there's no reason for them not to go in a straight line. So they go in a straight line until they run into something. Uh, mean free path is the average distance that they travel between collisions. So here we have an illustration of particles, and we see they're moving around, and the length of these red lines represents the mean free path, the distance they travel between colliding, either with another molecule or with the walls. As pressure increases, the particles are going to be closer together. And so, as you can imagine, they're going to run into each other and run into the walls more frequently. And so the re, uh, mean free path is going to go down. And just um, so you have an idea, if, if nitrogen was the size of a golf ball, it would go about 40 feet between collisions. So that's pretty good, you know, golf ball going 40 feet before it runs into something. Sometimes it'll be longer, sometimes it'll be shorter. It's average. So gas molecules spread out. This is how they fill their containers. And they spread from high concentration to low concentration, and that's known as diffusion, the process by which they go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Heavier particles will diffuse more slowly, and lighter particles will diffuse more quickly. A related but different process is a gas escaping through a hole into a vacuum, and that's called effusion. 
So this is the movement of a gas through a, a small hole. The rates of diffusion and effusion are both related to the root mean square average velocity, which makes sense. If you think about, say, a group of people, perhaps, and think about them spreading out, if they're running fast, they're going to spread out more quickly. If they're walking and strolling, they're going to spread out slower. So the gas particles that are moving faster are going to spread more quickly. Heavier particles move slower than light particles, and so heavier gases diffuse and effuse slower. What we find is at the same temperature, the rate of gas movement is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. And that has to do with that relationship between root mean square velocity and the molar mass that we just looked at. So Graham's law of effusion, we could derive it, but we're not going to, is right here. The rate of effusion of gas A is proportional to the rate of effusion of gas B in the same ratio as the square roots of their molar masses. Helium, have you ever noticed this? Helium escapes from a balloon faster than air does. If you had two balloons, same, same kind of balloon material, filled to the same size, and you wait a couple days, the helium balloon is going to get small faster. Why do balloons get small? Because there are small holes, tiny, tiny holes in the latex balloon. And the gases effuse through those holes. Helium, helium atoms effuse faster than air does. And that's why the helium balloon will go flat faster than a, a balloon full of air. Here we have a picture of effusion, um, a vacuum over here. And the gas particles are bouncing around. When does it go through the hole? When it happens to be, be in direct line to collide with where the hole is, it's going to happen to go through the hole. So you can imagine that if these particles are moving faster, more of them are going to just randomly go through that little tiny hole. If they're moving very slowly, it, they're going to go through the hole more slowly. It does not have to do with the size of the particle being too big to go through the hole. It has to do with larger particles move more slowly, and so their random paths of straight line collisions here they're going to hit that hole less frequently than the smaller particles that are moving faster. Does that make sense? Find the ratio of effusion rates of hydrogen gas and krypton gas. Well, we need Graham's law of effusion for this. So Graham's law of effusion says the rate of A to the rate of B is equal to the square root of the molar mass of B over the molar mass of A. We said with the uh, root mean square velocity equation that this molar mass was in kilograms per mole. Um, here it doesn't matter because the units are going to cancel out. So whatever units we want to use there are going to be fine. So let's call hydrogen A, and krypton is going to be B. Or you know what, let's just not even do that. The rate, we want helium to krypton. So that's going to be the molar mass of krypton over the molar mass of helium. Because it's inversely. Yes. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Thank you. They both start with H. Isn't that close enough? No, it isn't. Thank you. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Okay, H2. Hmm. 
Well, what's the molar mass of krypton? 83.8. Eighty-three point eight zero grams per mole. What's the molar mass of hydrogen? It's two times the mass of hydrogen, two point zero one six grams per mole. And it's the square root of that. The square root comes from um, kinetic energy being one half mass velocity squared. So when we're looking at just velocity, we have to take square roots of things. 83.8 divided by 2.016 equals, and the square root of that, should have done it differently, that's okay, 6.4, um, 6.447. Does that have units? No. These units canceled out. If I did these in kilograms per mole or grams to mole, the units are still going to cancel out. The ratio is 6.447 to 1. Helium, helium, I'm stuck on helium. Hydrogen is going to effuse 6.447 times faster than krypton. Yes? How many of the hydrogen units there? That's a good question. How many don't? How do I know? Well, um, I used four significant figure uh, molar masses. If I used more, if, you know, because this periodic table gives me more, it gives me um, six for hydrogen, um, it still only gives me four for krypton. But it's based on the molar masses that I chose. Any other questions? Significant figures can get a little screwy with the square root. Thing, but we're not going to worry about it. Uh, what about real gases? This is another section.